Okay. This conference will now be recorded. Thank you. Sylvia? Let us pray. Lord, I pray that you will give each and every person on our Bible study an added measure of faith today. Okay. Enlarge okay. our ability to believe in you, your word, and your promises, your ways, and your power. Put a longing in our hearts to talk with you and hear your voice. Give us each an understanding of what it means to bask in your presence and not just ask for things. May we seek you, rely totally upon you, be led by you, put you first in our lives, and acknowledge you in everything we do. Lord, we, you have said in your word that whatever is not from faith is sin, Romans 14, 23. May we be free from doubt and, and uh, anything that holds back our faith. Lord, we lift up each and every prayer request that we spoke earlier and those that are unspoken. Father, uh, we know that you are active and interested in answering our prayers and that uh, we, we do not doubt at all in your ability and willingness to meet us at our point of need in your own way. We look for your will, Father, not our own. We trust you for it. We ask that you open our hearts and our minds to your word this evening. Send the power of our Messiah, Yeshua. We lift this in prayer and also in the Holy Spirit we cooperate. Amen. Amen. And welcome to Howard from Hiawassee, Georgia. Glad you're here. Hi, Howard. So if you're following along, we are in the Gospel of John, and uh, we will begin this study in John chapter 13 and verse 1. Um, here in this study, uh, we come to the final night in the life of Jesus before his uh, crucifixion. And you remember over the past couple of weeks that we were studying John chapter 12, that those events which took place during what we refer to as the Passion Week, uh, the final week in the life of Jesus. And John chapter 12 describes the events of Passion Week. And you remember that Jesus was given a hero's welcome as he rode in to the Eastern Gate uh, to, uh, of the temple. Uh, and then uh, from that Sunday in John chapter 12, uh, the last verse we studied was John 12, verse 50. And until this next verse in John 13 and verse 1, um, uh, it skips from Sunday until Wednesday. And so uh, John, the writer of this gospel, chose not to cover any of the historic events uh, that happened on the Monday and Tuesday during Passion Week, yet for whatever reason, you know, he he just skips right over and goes to uh, to uh, Wednesday. And so, wh where we find ourselves now in the beginning of Chapter 13 is the final night, the final night in the life of Jesus Christ. Um, before his crucifixion. And what we're going to be finding here in chapters 13 all the way through to 17 of the Gospel of John, we're gonna find a detailed accounting of events which took place in this one single night, uh, the final night in Jesus's life. So there's uh, five full chapters uh, of this, uh, this event of this one single night in the Gospel of John to cover. There's a handful of, of things that happen, and John goes over them in detail. And so what we what we find here as we begin uh, our study is the, uh, the humility of Jesus Christ. We're going to witness Jesus emptying himself uh, you see on one hand that you have Jesus, who is God manifested in the flesh. Uh, yet on the other hand, Jesus reduces himself, himself to a human being, and he humbles himself in front of all of these uh, disciples 
uh, and he humbles himself all the way through to the cross. Welcome, Ron Hillman from South Georgia. Glad you're here. Uh, then you see uh, these 12 guys, these, these disciples, who are totally clueless to the events that are about to happen, while at the same time, they're completely and totally full of themselves. Uh, they're locked into a heated debate among each other uh, as to which of them is the greatest. Uh, and this is what they're arguing. Uh, who is the greatest? Uh, and, and, uh, and who is going to be um, anointed or appointed or elected as the vice president of the kingdom of heaven on earth by Jesus? That's all they're, they're, they're concerned with. They're in the middle of this, uh, this debate. And yet what Jesus is doing is he's humbling himself here at this Last Supper. He's right in the middle of demonstrating his humbleness. He's right in the middle of demonstrating his love for these guys. Uh, and uh, he's about to introduce communion. And these guys are just totally focused on who is the greatest among them. And so the, uh, the, uh, we're going to see this contrast, uh, the humility of Jesus versus uh, the, the self-centered behavior of these 12 guys uh, who believe that Jesus is about to select one of them as the vice president of the kingdom of heaven on earth. And they're locked into this heated debate um, as to which one of them is going to uh, be the best of them all. Okay, so with that in mind, uh, let's start out with... Um, Let's start out with uh, with Joyce. Joyce, would you unmute, please? And would you read just verse one? Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Yes, yeah, so now we arrive at the final night we have Jesus along with the 12 disciples who are completely undeserving. They're completely clueless, yet Jesus loves them, uh, even with their shortcomings. And we might just pause for a moment and realize that the unconditional love of Jesus is not just for the 12, even with their shortcomings, but that unconditional love is for you and it's for me as well even though each of us have our own shortcomings. And now Jesus is going to begin to demonstrate his humility, and he is going to show us how low it is that he is going to actually go in his humility in order to demonstrate his love to the, these 12 guys. And so, uh, and so as we continue now in verse 2, notice that between verse 1 and verse 2, that they have already finished the Passover meal, the Passover Seder. Uh, and if you don't know what that is, you might want to attend our Monday night group uh, where we're going over the Passover and the seven feasts of the Lord Monday nights. And so we know uh, typically the Passover Seder takes several hours. So it's it's uh, between verse 1 and 2, the, 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 the the Passover Seder is now finished. All right, so um, Roger, can I get you to unmute and read just verse two, please? The evening meal was being served and the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. Yes, yeah, so we know that throughout history, <clears throat> there have been many people who have taken a a sympathetic viewpoint of Judas, or that somehow that Judas was a victim here, uh, that perhaps he was well-intended and he got a little bit knocked off the rails and made some mistakes. But if you are one of those people who have taken a sympathetic viewpoint of Judas, you need to remember the words that came right out of the Lord Jesus's mouth uh, that we um, 
we studied back in chapter six of the Gospel of John in verse 70, which says the following. Jesus replied to them, didn't I choose you, the 12? Yet one of you is the devil. Yet one of you is the devil. So understand that Jesus is calling Judas a devil. And for the Son of God to call you devil, likely I would not select uh, you to be working, let's say, in our church's children's ministry. Okay, Jesus, uh, Judas was not a good guy. Notice we're told here that the devil has put into Judas's heart um, uh, and that he is now going to betray Jesus. Now, you might want to recall that a few days earlier of this particular event that we're studying on that Sunday, a couple days earlier, during this, uh, our study in chapter 12 of John, Judas went to the high priests. Jesus has humiliated Jesus, uh, Judas in front of uh, the house of Lazarus, Mary and Martha. Uh, Jesus publicly rebuked Judas. Uh, you remember Judas was criticizing Mary for dumping this full vial of uh, spikenard onto Jesus's feet that had a value, maybe today value of, of $50,000. And Judas stood up and said, you know, is that not a waste of money? We could be using that for something else. Knowing that Judas was in charge of the purse strings of Jesus's ministry. And so uh, Jesus rebuked J uh, Judas in front of uh, all of those people. And so Judas perhaps uh, at that point went out to the um, uh, the religious leaders in, in he had already cut a deal with them, and uh, he's just awaiting for the opportunity to present itself uh, to implement that deal that he made with the religious leaders. We're told by James that sin, sin is produced in our life uh, when, well, it says this in James chapter 1, verses 14 through 16. But each person is tempted when he is drawn away and enticed by his own evil desires. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is fully grown, it gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dearly loved brothers. Yeah, so here is how this happens. We have a desire, and many times we have a desire to sin. That's human nature. Yet, we don't have the opportunity to sin. Therefore, sin does not manifest itself. Sometimes, though, we have an opportunity to sin, but we don't feel like sinning, and so sin does not manifest itself. But just like human conception, when a man and a woman get together, uh, when an opportunity and a desire come together, sin is conceived, and the sin comes forth, and when sin is done with you, it will bring you uh, bring forth death. So here we have Judas. He has the desire, and now he is just waiting for the opportunity, which is just really moments away. He knows Jesus's schedule. He knows Jesus's movements. He uh, he knows that Jesus has a favorite place to go to. Uh, for a quiet time of prayer to be isolated. And so while Jesus and the other 11 head up to the mountain, Judas cuts out and gets, uh, gets together with the Jewish leadership and leads them to a place of isolation where they can pick up Jesus while he's praying uh, so that they don't do this in front of large crowds that are supporting Jesus's ministry. All right, uh, Sheila, can I get you to read verse 3, please, nice and loud. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things to his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God. Yeah, so remember 
that we are told in the Gospel of Matthew that all power, all right, it doesn't say some, it says all, all power has been given to Jesus or unto Jesus. Matthew chapter 28 and verse 18, if you're taking notes. Then Jesus came near and said to them, all authority. Uh all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Yes, yeah, so you ask yourself, uh, how much is all when it comes to power? How much is all? Well, how can any person, when you think about the fact that Jesus said that all power is his in heaven and earth, how can anyone then deny the deity of Jesus Christ? And, and when all power has been given to him, you cannot deny the deity of Jesus Christ. If you have all power, does that not put you at the very top of, of the food chain, so to speak? There are, is no one else ahead of you when you have all the power. And so here we have Jesus who has received all power, and he knows that the time has come. Yet notice what Jesus does with all power, which has been given to him. Let's take a look now. Uh, let's go to Diane, if you wouldn't mind unmuting. Uh, verse number four, please. Uh, if you could unmute, uh, Diane, there you go. Is it? Okay. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. Thank you. So Jesus gets up from the table. He takes off the uh, outer garment, which is, you know, which uh, back in those times, your garments, it's true today, you're, sometimes your garments determine what position or role you take in the community. He's taking off the outer garments, which de uh, designated him as a, as a rabbi or a leader or a chief. And he puts those garments aside uh, and he puts on just the garments that designate him as a slave. Mike, can you read the next verse, verse number five? Then he poured water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Thank you. All right, so I'm going to make a few comments, and then we're going to pause for a few minutes to ask you for your comments and questions. So you have to understand, in this culture, uh, they did not wear closed shoes like we would wear today but rather they wore sandals and when they they walked everywhere and while they were walking they did not have paved roads they did not have cement sidewalks in this culture so as they would walk their feet would constantly get filthy and so when you arrive at someone's home as a guest of that home like these guys were guests for the Passover Seder or the Last Supper, the lowest ranking servant within that household would be charged with washing the feet of the guests. And if I could not afford to have a servant uh, as the homeowner, I would wash your feet myself. This was an act of courteous, sorry, courtesy. This was an act of politeness. Uh, and this was a common practice in the first century culture. And so you picture the scene here. You have Jesus humbling himself. Uh, and you have 12 guests. You have the disciples, all of whom were full of themselves. And, um, and, and believing that the greatest thing, uh, they are the greatest thing since sliced bread, these uh, or slice matzah, uh, like I put in my uh, in my notes, and likely thinking that throughout this meal, why hasn't somebody washed my feet yet? You know, why am I eating supper with uh, with dirty feet? That's probably what they were thinking uh, in this culture. Someone uh, in this culture is supposed to wash the guests' feet, and not and none of the disciples will get up and offer to wash everybody's feet because that would be a demonstration that they're lower than the other people at the at the Seder, which means 
uh, that would violate their their argument of who is the greatest, you see. So they nobody offered to wash the feet because the, all I could think about is who is the greatest. Uh, and um, and so um, if that were to happen, if they were to get up and wash the feet, then that would possibly jeopardize them being elected as the new vice president of the king of heaven, of kingdom of heaven on earth. Um, so now we have Jesus, the master of this dinner, the leader, and he is taking the position, the lowest position in the house. He's 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 humbling himself to the lowest position, which is also an indication of Jesus saying, I have no servant, uh, so I am going to wash your feet myself. All right, we're going to pause just for a couple minutes before we get into verse six. Does anybody have a comment or a question or a takeaway? We'll start with Pam, and then we'll go to uh, Sheila, and then Arnie. Go ahead, Pam. This may not have uh, much importance, but uh, I read someplace else, or maybe in one of your Bible studies, they had said that the 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 feet were even more disgusting than just walking in dirt because they used to throw their garbage, and the sewage was in the streets. Um, and, and so it, it was a little more than just dirt that she was washing off his feet. Yeah, it was pretty, it was pretty disgusting. Yeah. And there were no closed shoes, but thank you for that. Uh, Sheila. Okay. I got to talk about God's feast and it's, it's feast of God. There are important truths. God's appointed day and time are to teach us God's truth. And some of the most significant things God has ever done, he uses his feasts and festivals, which are one and the same. John uses these festivals to teach us about Yeshua's ministry. Jesus's ministry. So there's no coincidence here. Um, so important. And I know I got to put Monday night, Robert's covering it so well. Um, so this again, in his feast are all about Jesus, which means redemption. Um, and the other thing about the washing of feet, uh, is, is Jesus, again, is teaching us to be humble and how we're to use that. Everything Jesus does, we're to incorporate in us. And he shows us that we are to be humble at all times. And I just love that verse. Yeah, and, and so uh, just to build a little bit on what Sheila is saying is that uh, the two the two main uh, themes uh, that Jesus expressed that he quoted from uh, Deuteronomy six five love God with all your heart mind and mind and soul soul heart soul and might and uh, and then uh, Leviticus nineteen eighteen love your neighbor as yourself and and the word love as we discussed just a couple of nights ago, is an action word. Hebrew is a very action-oriented language. It's an action word, it's not an emotion. And so here he's demonstrating through his humility, serving his brothers, uh, uh, and he's demonstrating how we're to live. Go ahead, Arn. Thank you, Sheila. And then Mike will be next. In the first verse, John refers to his hour had come. And it's interesting, John uses that term six times in his book. Uh, the first two times that he used it back in the earlier chapters was when Mary said, hey, they're out of wine. And Jesus' response was, it's not my hour. And then when he was in uh, Jerusalem, uh, talking about the temple being destroyed and then re repaired in three days, they wanted to seize him. But again, it was not his hour. It shows the perfect timing of God. This is his hour. Yeah, 
Yeah, exactly. So, uh, and his his hour his hour was expressed to come a couple of chapters ago when we talked about uh, that miracle of turning the water into wine uh, during um, uh, that wedding uh, that wedding time. Uh, and then he did say, Our, "My hour has come." Go ahead, Mike. You're next, and then uh, Carrie will be after that, and then uh, Sylvia's got a comment. Yeah, uh, Rob. Just a quick quick question. When the Jewish people uh, practice, not practice, uh, undergo the Seder, do they, is this a foot washing, a ritual part of it too now, or is that something in the past? No, there's nothing in the Haggadah that I have seen for feet washing. Uh, they, they do have, the, they do have a ritualistic hand washing uh, which, in fact, many of you who attended uh, one of our seders at uh, Auntie and Ed's house, uh, we actually went through that ritual just to show you what it was like. That where we, uh, you have a certain method of of cleansing your hand and saying a certain blessing in Hebrew, which I did for each participant. But uh, I don't know of I've never seen in in Haggadah, which is let's just say the guide and the format for uh for the uh the order of the seder uh i don't I, i've never seen that there are churches that do that uh but it's not in the haggadah now okay yeah uh carrie's next then sylvia and then dan okay um i just want to say all this time through the other previous chapters uh, and leading up to his last day, um, Jesus has been trying to not only teach them, but show them what is coming, what is happening, and also how giving, uh, giving uh, showing them how they should act and live, follow him. But all that time, especially his disciples, they still didn't get it from what i can see so what does he get from them except they got a conversation about who's going to be the greatest and I'm, right. so i'm thinking you know he's sitting at the table like well i don't believe these guys um so then he goes into okay let me let me teach one let me try it one more time one last lesson he teaches okay you if the greatest of these is the servant so if you want to be in my kingdom, you, uh, the, the greatest of these is servant. So the least of these shall be the greatest. So he had to put on, the, the as you said, the garment of servant, servant and actually show them, okay? And yeah. I don't know if they got it then. Also, I don't think they got it that he was getting ready to leave them. <laughs> yeah, they were clueless, but we will cover a little bit about uh, being a servant in a little while. Exactly your point. Uh, we'll cover that sh shortly. Uh, Sylvia is next, and then Dan. So I think it's significant that what the part we read in Matthew 28 about all power being given unto Jesus by the Father. Uh, so he was omnipotent. He was a member of the Godhead. He comes into town that Sunday night as a hero. Okay, the crowds were loving him. They were saying, Hosanna, save now. They were laying the palms down before him. And then this final evening, he comes in and there are all the disciples who are supposed to be following him, uh, are bickering about who's the greatest in the, in the bunch and who, who Jesus loves the most and all this. And and as disciples, they're supposed to be imitating him, okay? And he comes in, even though he's a hero, he's omnipotent, he is all powerful, and and a member of the Godhead. He comes in and sh shows them how to be servants, okay? How to love one another, okay? How to be humble, and and the disciples were still clueless. They were egotistical. They were clamoring for the power position. And he showed them humility and love despite their shortcomings. And I also wanted to mention, you know, it talked about sin. And sin will always take you further and lower than you can initially ever imagine. Yeah. 
Okay, good job. Well, I take one more comment and then we're going to continue on so we can cover all the verses. Uh, Dan, go ahead. Yeah, in verse in verse one it says uh, he loved them to the end. So the the word loved is uh, agapo, uh, and it's in the aorist uh, tense, which means that it's a, a concept of the verb is considered without regard for past, present, or future time. So this love is not just the you know that love at that time. This is like past, present, future, and then the end is telos. And the word telos uh, comes from uh, telo, which means to set out for a, a definite point or a goal. So uh, Jesus's love, past, present, and future, is is pointing or or, or uh, leading to a definite point or goal. His love is a uh, is moving us in a direction. Uh, Jesus love never Jesus loves never ends, and his love sets us out for a definite point or goal. Yes, yeah, it, it kind of reminds you of the word Torah, uh, which is, you know, direction. Uh, it's something that you should uh, picture uh, a bullseye target um, where where the words of, of the, the scripture are to uh, instruct you and to lead your life so that you can reach a certain goal. And uh, very good. Interesting. Uh, so the love. The love that Jesus is demonstrating here has a similar value and meaning that it's it's to lead us to a to a, a certain endpoint. Uh, Arnie and Helen, can I get you to read one verse each, six and seven, please? Unmute. You want to start? He, he came to Simon Peter, who said to him, "Lord, are you going to watch my feet?" Jesus answered him, "What I'm doing." You do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Yeah, so Jesus is saying you do not understand what is going on now, but you will understand later on. So understand that Jesus is not initiating the practice of feet washing. That's not what he's doing here. Uh, you have churches today, and I think I may have touched on this when I was answering Mike's question. You have churches today who are in the practice of having feet washing services, and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, that's that's a wonderful way for people to demonstrate their concern for their brothers and sisters. But understand that in order for a church to take on a new ordinance, in other words, to make it part of the the practice of a of a church there are certain requirements it's kind of like there were requirements to canonize each scripture that we study there's a requirement to add an, an ordinance into a church there are three requirements the first is that you have to see it in the gospels the second is that you have to see it practiced in the book of acts and the third is it has to be addressed by the uh, the letters of the apostles. So when it comes to feet washing, we do see it in the life of Jesus, unquestionably, but we do not see it practiced in the book of Acts. We do not see it expounded in the letters of the apostles. Uh, so when we look at baptism, for example, or we look at communion as an example, we see those things in the gospels. We, we see it practiced in the book of Acts. And we also see it spoken of in the letters by the apostles. And so that, that then becomes the practice or the ordinances of, of churches. So if you want to wash feet, as they say in Yiddish, gay is into hey, go and have fun with it. Okay, nothing wrong with that. That was a little Yiddish for you people. Okay, <laughs> I'm trying to help you here, Yiddish. Uh, you know, so if you want to wash feet, Go ahead and wash feet. If your heart is there to show and demonstrate that you that you have love and concern uh, for your brothers and sisters, uh, that's what Jesus was doing. He was demonstrating uh, it's a it's not a practice, but rather he's doing a lesson here. He's teaching them something, but it's not a practice of the church. It's uh, it is not the actual washing of the feet that needs to be looked at here, but rather he's teaching them a lesson in humility. Let's take a look at verse number eight. Ron Hillman, can I get you to unmute, please? 
and read verse number eight. Okay, uh, Howard, can I get you to unmute and read verse number eight? Unmute, please. Ron, sometimes. <laughs> Verse eight, no, please. no, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash yours, you have no part with me. All right, so this addresses, this addresses something that Carrie Crawford was saying earlier. So look, in Peter's mind, likely he is thinking, uh, he thinks by saying what he said, uh, that he's elevating himself in the eyes of Jesus so that he can he could be the one nominated as the vice president of the kingdom of heaven on earth. But notice Jesus' response here. It does not say, you have no part in me. That's not what it says here, but rather it says, you have no part with me. This, my friends, is all about fellowship. This is about a relationship, your relationship or hanging out together. And in this case, it's about a relationship that Peter's having with uh, the Lord Jesus. Okay, um, uh, Boyd, can I get you uh, to read verse number nine? And then uh, Pamela, if you would unmute, read verse 10. And then Carrie Crawford, if you would unmute and read verse 11. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who should betray him. Therefore said he, you are not all clean. Yeah, so this is going to turn out to be a very challenging night uh, for uh, this so-called first pope of the church, who is Peter. Um, uh, he is going to get rebuked over and over again. Here, Peter thinks he's making brownie points with Jesus, but what happens is Jesus is giving Peter uh, a great lesson. This is one of the most important spiritual truths that we can learn from scripture. So I'm hoping and praying that you listen very carefully about what I'm about to say. Jesus is saying to Peter, you already have been washed, Peter. Uh, what you need is to have your feet cleaned. Now, He's using this as an example to explain something that is a spiritual truth. All right, so this is not one of those, this is not one of those scriptures, and, and Arnie, we've talked about this so many times over the last four years. This is not one of those scriptures where you take it fully and completely literally. He is doing something more deep, more spiritual. So let me explain what the spiritual lesson is that he's talking about. Um, um, understand that in the first century, in this culture, only the wealthy families would have bathing facilities in their own homes. Uh, typically, there was no bathtub in a home. Typically, there was no shower, <laughs> a shower inside of, uh, of a home. <clears throat> But rather, in this in this culture, they would have community bathing facilities. They'd have separate facilities for men and women called bathhouses in the community. And that is where people would bathe. But as you dry yourself off and you put your clothing on from that community bathing area and you walk back to your house, or to, uh, to where your, your guests were, sorry, where you were invited to as a guest, uh, you would be walking on a dirty road uh, 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 in, in sandals. 
And so by the time you got back in your in your sandals, your feet would be dirty once again. No concrete walkways, no paved roads, just dusty roads. And so by the time you get there, you were dirty again, just in your feet. So you wouldn't go back to the bathhouse just to wash your feet and then come back again because your feet would be burnt, uh, dirty again, obviously. So uh, the spiritual truth here is that the day that you and I receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, when we accepted Christ into our hearts, into our life, please listen carefully, we were cleansed. The day you accepted Jesus, you were cleansed. When you apply the blood of Jesus Christ into your life or into your heart, it is a once and a, a once and only event that needs to take place. It is now and forever. Your salvation is forever. You are cleansed before God forever. What Jesus is talking about here in a more in a more spiritual sense. All sin is washed away, past, present, and future. And once you apply the blood of Christ to your life, you are cleansed. Then we begin from that cleansing, from that, that salvation, we begin to walk home. Now, our home is not our address where we live in Hiawassee or Myrtle Beach. That's not our home address. This earth is not our home. We are here temporarily. We're living our life here and we're making our way back home for eternity. And during that time that we are making our way back home, our eternal home, our feet are going to get a little dirty. Sometimes we do things we should not be doing. Sometimes we say things we should not be saying. Sometimes we have thoughts that we probably wouldn't share with other people because we'd be embarrassed to do so. Why? We shouldn't be thinking those thoughts. But we get a little dirty. That is our human nature. The thing which we do in our culture today, which is wrong, and the reason why there's such a cycle of sin within the Christian community is that a believer will typically, when they sin, they're going to go back and plead the blood of Christ. And we seem to always be going back and pleading the blood of Christ and asking God to save us once again. And, and we have churches, my friends, in, in communities all across this nation. Who every week, we have the same people going up to the pulpit to ask for God to give them salvation. All over again. And the Bible teaches us that the day that you apply the blood of Jesus Christ, that you are saved once and for all, for all eternity. You're saved. You're as saved today as you ever will be saved. And so here we have a picture of Jesus teaching this lesson. In fact, we have the same picture in the Old Testament, ancient Israel, Worship God in the tabernacle. The tabernacle was a great big tent. This is before the temple. Uh, the first and second temple, they had a tabernacle before that. And inside the tent, you would have the Ark of the Covenant. And it was the desire of the priests to get inside the tent because that was where the presence of God would be found. On the outside of the tent, as you were entering into the tabernacle, there was a fenced off area that had two pieces of furniture, which were in a fenced off area. 
And as you would approach the tabernacle, you would first come to something called the brazen altar. Brazen altar. So uh, the brazen altar is where the blood would be shed and your sin would be atoned. And it was that altar where you made yourself right with God. All right, if you want to study it, you're taking notes, you can look at Exodus chapter 30, verse 28, Psalm chapter 43, verse 4, and Malachi chapter 2 and verse 13. After you pass the brazen altar, where you, you shed the blood of a sacrifice, then you continue toward the entrance of the tabernacle, and now you're... Uh, now you've got something called the brazen labor. So, you know, the, the tabernacle is where you find the presence of God. You're not on pavement. You're not on concrete, but rather you're on dirt. You see, this is what Jesus is explaining as a deeper spiritual meaning. When you went into the tabernacle, you were walking on dirt. And there you would have to stop and you'd have to wash your feet at the brazen laver. If you want to read about it, you can read about it in Exodus chapter 30 and verse 18. So there are two cleansings here, and we'll have a discussion about it in a minute. There are two cleansings. You've got public cleansing, which is where I receive Jesus Christ, and then there's a private cleansing, and, and where does the private cleansing take place? We wash ourselves in the blood of Christ. We wash ourselves in the water of the word of God. And the reason why so many Christians today are weak or anemic in their faith walk, the reason why Christians today commit the same sins over and over and over again is because when we recognize that we have dirty feet, when we recognize that we have been stained by this current evil age in our, in our culture, uh, we immediately run back to the cross and plead the blood of Christ rather than washing ourselves in the written word of God. That is how we cleanse our feet as we make this walk to our eternal place, we are to cleanse our feet in the written word of God. We are to apply the blood of Christ once and for all, and then that blood of Christ is so efficient, it will remain for eternity. But when we get stained, when our feet get dirty, we are not to go back and, and plead the blood of Christ again, but we are to go to the written word of God. Remember John 1 says, in, in, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. We go back to God through his written word. And that is what cleans us. That is the, that is the water that washes the dirty feet. But our journey for cleaning our dirty feet, we must go to the written word of God. And how does a man or a woman cleanse his way? But by every word of God. Yet we find the average Christian today who is anemic in their faith, and they have a, a, a lack of understanding of the written word of God. Look, I know I'm preaching to the choir here because you're here studying the written word of God tonight, but that is the solution. You wash your dirty feet on this journey with the written word of God, and that will, that will reduce the cycle of repeating sin in your life. It will also change your heart. It'll change your attitude. and. Uh, uh, we will no longer be anemic in our walk of faith, uh, and we will no longer be influenced by our culture by pleading the blood of Christ and washing our feet in the written word of God. We do not need to get saved again, but we need to study and we need to live by the written word of God. That is where we find our power. 
Our power is in the power of the written word of God. And that, my friends, is what will begin to change our lives. So Jesus is telling the disciples here, if you want to have fellowship with me, that's Jesus talking. You want to walk in this world with me, that's Jesus talking, then let me apply the water. Let me say it in a different way. Let me apply the written word of God to your feet. Questions, comments, takeaway, first, first 10 verses. All right, Brother Mike, you're next. Oh, on mute. Uh, now, yeah, thank you. Uh, Rob, would you equate or not uh, the word repentance to washing your feet with the written word of God? Is that sort of the same thing? Well, yeah, you always have to start with repentance, okay, because you have to, there has to be contrition. You, you have to, your heart has to say, I, I, I didn't want to do that even though I did because it's it's violating God's will. And so repentance is is very important as a first step because repentance, Mike, as you know, is a two-step process. It's two parts, I mean. You're turning away from something and you're turning back to something else. So if repentance is required, it's because you're you're facing or following or doing that which our culture does, which is led by the devil. So repentance is turning from our culture and turning back towards God. And, and when you turn back towards God, in my opinion, and thank you for asking my opinion, uh, from what I can gather here from Scripture, and especially this spiritual lesson that we have here in these verses, turning back to God would include studying and reading the written word of God and then applying that to your life on how you live. Thank you. I think that's an excellent answer. I got lucky on that one, Mikey. You get an A. <laughs> you get an A, bro. Well said. <laughs> Go ahead, Dan. <laughs> yeah, so that, that word clean, clean in the Greek is uh, katharos, if I'm saying that right. And in chapter 15, it says, you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. So there, you know, again, it's the word makes them clean. And the, the word is, this is Jesus in, in, Matt, in John 15, it's Jesus's word. And he's the, he's the, uh, the prophet that, that uh, Moses said would be raised up and we should listen to his words, right? Him you should listen to. Uh, back in, uh, I think, uh, Exodus uh, or Deuteronomy 18. And then the other thing is, uh, I liked what you were saying about uh, about uh, the cleansing of the water. Uh, it brought me back to Ezekiel chapter 36, which is one I love. Uh, in verse 25, it says, then I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. So in context, I'm going to read the same thing. That was verse 25. I'm going to start back in verse 23. I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned, profaned in their midst. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, when I prove myself holy among you in their sight. For I will take you from the nations gather you from all the lands and bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from your filthiness and from all your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. So I think that, you know, Jesus washing their feet uh, on the night of Passover and uh, Ezekiel 36 is the uh, is one of the scriptures about the new covenant. You know, they're all it's all tied together. Good job. Thank you for sharing that. Anybody else have a comment before we move on? Sylvia. OK, so 
uh, just to kind of encapsulate what we're talking about, when we accept Jesus, we're cleansed of all sin, all unrighteousness, past, present, and future. We get a clean slate, okay? And salvation is accomplished forever. However, since we are still humans and have the propensity to sin, uh, we have that sinful nature, occasionally we will fall away. And the Lord fortunately has given us an opportunity to get right with him again when we are not, when we sin. And we are in need of repentance and God's forgiveness. He knows this. He's made a way. But we don't need to be saved again. We are saved. And when you're saved, the Holy Spirit is sealed within you until the day of redemption. It's like a, uh, it's like a, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Something when you go to a, to a, a pawnbroker, you get a. Oh, so. Uh, or something. It's there, it, no matter what, even yeah. if you've lost it as far as, you know, uh, sinning. Uh, you will, you are sealed till the day of redemption, and he is not willing for any who, uh, that any should perish who are his own. He will not lose one. Remember the fishes in the net. So, um, when we accept, uh, so, um, but as, okay, here. Um, so, that reference to the fishes in the net has to do with uh, that 153 fish where uh, that time when they pulled it up and it was so heavy. Uh, and the net did not break. Um, and 153 in Gematria uh, equals the phrase in Hebrew, uh, the children of, of Israel or B'nai Israel, uh, the Gematria or the numerology is 153. So when 153 showed up, they understood what it meant. Uh, and with the fish net not breaking where it did before, it was a demonstration or an illustration that once you're in that net, no, no one's, no one fish will be lost. Right. Now you can, you can sin and not repent and, and have to pay a, a price. Oh, well, anyway. <laughs> okay, we won't get into that. So, uh, okay, so I thought it was interesting. Also, uh, in the tabernacle with the brazen altar which is the atonement of sin, uh, the, the wages of sin are death. Therefore, a blood sacrifice unto death is required wow. to pay for sin. Okay, and Jesus accomplished that. That's why it's so important to believe on Jesus so that the Lord sees us through that blood that he has shed for us so that we are saved. So I just want to clarify that for those who are not familiar. Um, also, the brazen laver was to wash the feet before entering. It's another way of getting repentance and forgiveness, uh, representing that. Well, it's interesting. I'm getting a little epiphany here. You know, uh, oh. you know, uh, oh. the uh, the brazen laver washing your feet because you're on holy ground entering into yeah. the uh, the tabernacle where the presence of God is. And isn't that exactly in this lesson, that spiritual yes. lesson that Jesus was given to the disciples, washing your feet uh, wash the by studying and living according to the written word of God is how you and I enter into holy ground. Believing on the yeah, word. Yeah, Believing really cool. on the word, you see. I hadn't seen Jesus that Jesus was the word. Okay, yeah. so I got a little epiphany too. <laughs> <laughs> All right, yeah, so it's fun having epiphanies. You yeah. can join us whenever yeah, you'd like. Okay, <laughs> so um, <laughs> um, so I hope now that when you uh, uh, study uh, about uh, Jesus washing their feet, <clears throat> that it will remind you that we never lose our salvation, but when you want to be in fellowship and relationship with God, you're washing of feet. As we're on this journey to our eternal home, is uh, is done with the water of the written word of God, studying it and living by it. And to build it, up, it changes our hearts and our attitudes and our behavior when we truly repent and get cleansed. Okay, so it's our source of power. 
That's why the church is so weak today, because they don't believe in holiness. They don't believe in, a lot of them don't believe in true repentance. A lot of them don't want to get right with God because they don't want to admit their sin. So that's why a lot of, there, there's a lack of power in the church today, and I'm concerned about that. All right, we're going to continue on now. Great. Oh, uh, go ahead, Carrie. One more, and then we're going to continue on. Wow. You know, I'm supposed to be on another important call, but I just had to, I didn't want to get away from this lesson, and I'm glad I'm hearing it. But um, I just wanted to say, go back to, would you consider Peter's attitude when he said, oh, no, you're not going to wash my feet? Would you call that a uh, righteous indignation or um, what do you call it? Um, okay. you no, know, that's, uh, that's pride. Righteous indignation might be something like uh, Jesus appearing to be angry, but uh, uh, he was he was expressing indignation to the the coin changers in the church when he went in there and overturned them with his whip the temple uh, uh, to cleanse his father's house of all of the uh, uh, the leaven uh, that's righteous indignation uh, what Peter was doing was was just Pride. being being prideful yeah okay. and if you don't want Jesus to, to cleanse you. That's being prideful. That can steal an opportunity for salvation. Don't let your pride steal your opportunity for salvation. So we're going to continue on now. But uh, in, if you notice back in verse 11, the last verse we read, it says, for he knew who would betray him. Uh, they're talking about Jesus knew who would betray Jesus. This is why he said, you are not all clean. Uh, so it's obvious that Judas was never a believer and it's not like judas you know brought uh into believing uh he bought into the believing of jesus and then he changed his mind uh, the point is that judas was never never clean joyce can i get you to unmute again and read verse 12 and then roger can i get you to read 13 and then uh, uh sheila 14. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so. So for that is what I am. Thank you. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet thanks dan can i get you to read 15 and then uh mike and uh, diane 16 and 17. for i gave you an example so that you will also would do just just as i did for you i mute uh, mike and diane 16 and 17. Uh, truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master. Neither is one who is sent greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. All right, thank you. So there are two ways in which you can live your life. You can live your life looking at everyone who is around you and think, how can I benefit from them? or uh what do they have that i want that i can use or uh how can i use this person to advance my own personal interests in the world you can look at a person that way or you can look at a person and you can think how can that person be benefited by me or how can i serve that person or how can I lighten that person's heaviness or load? Uh, or how can I encourage that person? How can I make that person's life more livable than it is right now? Here you have 12 guys who just finished singing to Jesus, who they call master, they call him Lord, 
Uh, they call him Messiah. And how did Jesus live his life? Jesus did not live his life looking at other people with an attitude, how can they make my life better? But rather, Jesus lived his life looking at other people with the attitude, how can I be a blessing to those people? Each of us needs to ask ourselves a question. Am I lightening the load of my family? Am I being a blessing to those people who work with me or who are in my community? When people see you walking into a room, is there a heaviness that comes over them or is there an inspiration that comes over them because of your presence in the room? Are you making people's lives more difficult or are you making people's lives easier? So Jesus is looking at these leaders of the church. These guys become the leaders of the church. He's looking at them and he's saying that the role of a leader in a church is not to be a burden to everybody, but rather the role of a leader in the church is to be a blessing to everybody, to lift their burdens, to make their lives a little bit better, to make their lives a little easier. You know, I can't help but say, and it wasn't part of my lesson here, but you know, I love Howard so much and he's a dear, dear friend. And every time that we were together with Howard, when Fran was alive, we just lost her not long ago. But every time we spoke to Fran, on the telephone or in person or on these Bible studies, every single time, she, whatever came out of her mouth was words of encouragement for everybody around her. That's right. That's a godly demonstration of what Jesus is talking about here. That's what Jesus Christ did. He was an example that he left for you and me. Fran was one of those people that followed Jesus Christ. So the question you ask yourself, are you a burden to other people or are you a blessing to other people? Yeah. And if you call yourself a follower of Jesus Christ, if you call yourself a Christian, if you call yourself a Messianic Jew, all the same, right? Then we are to adopt this view of life. We are to be here in order that others will benefit from our presence in their life, and we are to be a blessing to them. Ellen, can I get you to read verse 18? <clears throat> I am not referring to all of you. I know those I have chosen, but this is to fulfill this passage of scripture. He who shared my bread has turned against me. Thank you. So very interesting verse here. Remember, Jesus just finished washing the feet of Judas. <clears throat> the heel of Judas was just lifted in front of Jesus. And you have to wonder what was going on through the mind of Judas, because he knew that in a short period of time that uh, right after Jesus is washing his feet and his heel, uh, uh, that uh, he knew that he was going to go out and betray uh, Jesus. And here Jesus is serving the very guy that's going to betray him. Uh, Jesus makes this guy, Judas's life easier. Jesus is humbling himself in front of Judas. Howard, can I get you to unmute and read verse 19? And then uh, Pamela, verse 20. All right, Pam, we're going to mute your screen because there's noise coming from the background. Go ahead, uh, Howard. I am telling you now before it happens so that when it does happen, you will believe that i am who i am gotcha all right i don't know what happened to pam uh carrie would you want to oh okay 
Barry, go ahead and read verse 20. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that receiveth whomsoever I send receiveth me, and he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. Thank you. So Jesus knew that Judas was going to betray him. No surprise there for Jesus. And it and and it is, is it not fascinating here? We have Jesus. It's late in the evening. You think about this for a second. Jesus knows everything. He's about to leave this upper room. He's about to cross over the Mount of Olives. He's about to give himself to prayer. And shortly thereafter, he knows that these special forces, these guys being led by, by Judas, uh, uh, and Jesus is going to be able to see them from a distance from the torches they're carrying, this lineup of torches, heading towards him. And he knows what's about to happen. <clears throat> Within hours, he knows he's going to be beaten uh, uh, mercilessly uh, and be crucified. And uh, he knows that he's going to be arrested around midnight. Uh, he knows that they're going to rush him through the Jewish courts. He knows they're going to rush him through the Roman courts. And by nine o'clock, he knows that he's going to be nailed after being beaten. He's going to be nailed to the cross. Isn't it interesting that with Jesus knowing all of these events clearly in his mind, what is he doing? What's his interest? What is he doing here? What's he demonstrating? He's demonstrating to these 11 guys uh, that uh, that um, he he wants to serve them. He cares about them. He loves them. Jesus is interested in the emotional state of these 11 guys who don't have anything better to do than to argue amongst themselves who is the greatest. Uh, these very same guys will not bother washing one another's feet uh, because of their own pride and self-centeredness. Uh, and, and, and so they make the master, they make Jesus wash their feet because of them not doing it. And so Jesus... Jesus loves these guys so much that his focus is to humble himself, to better their lives, even though that he knows within hours he's going to be beaten and, and, and hung on the cross, nailed to the cross. His, his focus is not on the horror that's about to happen to him within the next many hours, but rather his focus is, how can I comfort these guys? How can I encourage these guys? We can see from this uh, uh, how, how different Jesus is. Uh, we can see how Jesus looks at things completely different than you and I as a human being would look at things. We can see that Jesus's perspective is completely different than ours as human, you know, from our human nature. And most of us have read or heard these historic events over and over again. Um, and our human nature seems not to be emotionally moved or affected by what's about to happen to Jesus as we study this history. Jesus is demonstrating just how much he loves these guys and how much he loves you and how much he loves me. And perhaps we ought to be praying that we are in fact moved emotionally by the sacrifice that he made for each of us. Maybe we should have a freshness of emotion, uh, of God's spirit, of, of, of what he means to us and what he did for us and how much he loved us. A fresh appreciation for the wonderful gifts uh, of, of God's love to each of us, that, that he loved us so much that he died. He paid the price of the sin, uh, and, and he gave us the gift of eternal salvation. You know, uh, Arnie, I'm going to ask you, if you would, to unmute for just a minute. Uh, if you're somebody who is watching a video recording of this Bible study,
sometime out in the future. And yeah, we've been blessed with over 70,200 views of our Bible studies. Grateful for that. Uh, if you happen to be someone watching a video recording of this and you have not given your life, your heart to Jesus Christ, you believe that he died on the cross for your sin. He wants to love you this way as well and give you blessings of eternal salvation. And all you have to do is say a very simple prayer. Arnie, I'm gonna ask you to tell us what that prayer sounds like. And you can use the pause button on this recording to start and stop and repeat this prayer. Arnie. Lord Jesus, we confess our sins and ask for your forgiveness. Please come into our heart as our Lord and Savior. Take complete control of our life and help us to walk in your footsteps daily by the power of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord, for saving us and for answering our prayer. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And if you said that prayer for the first time watching this video, we congratulate you. We encourage you to study, continue to study the written word. Uh, and we welcome you into God's family. Thank you for that, Arnie. And thank you for quoting from Numbers chapter 6 and verses 24 and 26. Good job. Uh, just a quick uh, note that. This coming Monday will be in part four of the Feast of the Lord. If you missed any of them, you can watch our video recordings on our YouTube channel. It's a Moed. It's a divine appointment. This Monday <laughs> night is a divine appointment. Be there or be square. Yeah, yes. Right. And uh, uh, and next Thursday, a week from tonight, we'll finish John chapter 13, verses 21 to 38. Who has a comment, a question, a takeaway on anything? And John uh, chapter 13, verses 1 to 20, Arnie is next, and then Sylvia. I have two comments. The first one I want to say is, you know, in the previous chapters, John told about Jesus' public ministries. But this chapter is different. This is only him with his disciples attending this supper. This is not a public ministry. This is more like like a coach trying to get his team ready for the game or a colonel trying to get his soldiers ready for the battle. He's trying to prepare them uh, in this chapter. And then the other comment I have is how important it is to read the Bible from beginning to end because history does repeat itself. If you look at the last, uh, next to the last verse where it uh, said he ate my bread and he has lifted his heel against me. That's a repetition of Psalm 41, verse 9, where it says, Even my close friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted his heel against me. That was David way before that. Uh, history does repeat itself. Jesus came once, and he's going to come again. Amen. Good job. Sylvia's next, and then we have Dan after Sylvia, and then Mike. Okay, we need to love one another. We need to be willing to serve them so that they praise God because of that service. That's the whole thing. God wants, a, wants to do circles of blessing, circles of love, and, and that other people praise God because we are obedient to Christ, okay? So are we a blessing? or are we a burden to others? Are we encouraging others? Are we helping one another? Are we helping believers? Are we helping those who are unbelievers? Do we speak the truth in love to those who don't even know who Messiah is? We need to bear this in mind. And Jesus knew that Judas would soon betray him, but he still humbly and lovingly washed his feet don't you think that you know it should have had heaping burning coals on his head so to speak you know he should have been so humbled by the fact that jesus was willing to love him anyway that he that he wouldn't betray him but he did anyway so how cold was that 
He still betrayed Jesus, but Jesus never betrayed him. Good job, Dan, and then Mike after Dan. Yeah, I liked uh, Arnie's comment about history repeating itself. Uh, I think that's the reason that in uh, Matthew 5, verse 17 and 18, uh, Jesus says, uh, do not think that I came to abolish the law and the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill, because prophecy has can have multiple fulfillments. Right. We can see when the prophets are prophesying, they prophesy in the short term so that people know that their word is true. But they also have long term, long term prophecies. And and sometimes those prophecies can repeat like Arnie, you know, David spoke those words. And then and then in verse 19, Jesus says, uh, and it's basically <laughs> talking about the prophecy. Right. Jesus, Jesus uh, is hearing from God right through his ministry. He says, everything I have heard, I am doing, right? Everything I've heard, I am doing. But in verse 19, he says, from now on, I am going to tell you before it happens so that when it happens, you may believe that and know that I am he. So now he's kind of changing, changing. And it's not just he's doing the things the father tells him. He's going to tell his, his disciples, hey, this is what's going to happen. <laughs> this is what's going to happen. You know, you're going to deny, deny me three times or whatever it is, right? You're going to, you're, and you're going to know that it was, that there was a father that sent me. Good job, Mike. Yeah. Um, if you allow me to role play as a non-believer and read verse 18, I would like to hear your response. I do not speak of all of you. I know the ones I have chosen but it is that the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats my bread has lifted up his heel against me. Now, was Judas really responsible for his own actions? Well, I think Judas, I think, you know, your uh, human nature is such that you're, you're either following God or, you're following culture, which is led by the devil. And so Judas made a conscious choice. He had the opportunity and he had the desire. We, 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 Jesus, we, 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 and loved his own boy in the world. Hang on, I got to find out. Uh, Evening meal was in progress. Someone's, someone's got the Bible being read to them. There you go. Thank you. Uh, sorry, uh, I, I think in human nature is such that you're either following God or you're following the devil. Mm -hmm. I think it's, gotcha. uh, that, you know, if, if you, if you live your life according to the written word, then the Holy Spirit who is indwelling, uh, in that person is going to lead you and guide you. Uh, and I think if if you're if you're not a believer, if you don't have a relationship with God, then you're going to allow uh, culture to lead you and guide you, and culture is led by the devil. And so uh, we have a even even as a believer, even one who who lives their life according to the written word, we have a choice moment by moment to make a decision: Do I want to fill? Uh, uh, do I want to uh, make a de make a decision based upon my my flesh, my own personal desires, or do I want to make a decision that has the discernment of the written word of God? We have that choice to make moment by moment. I think in Judas's case, uh, he did not have a relationship with God, and so he was he was uh, led by culture which is led by the devil. And he had, uh, we went over the two components of what happens when it comes to sin. You have to have the desire and you have to have the opportunity. Uh, and even at, when you have a relationship with God, you're going to have desire. Sometimes you're gonna have opportunity. But when you make a decision, when there's opportunity and a desire at the same time, and you make a decision to, to consciously sin, uh, yeah, I think that's what Judas did. And I think that, uh, that, that he, he followed his father, which is the devil. 
the culture. Willful disobedience. Willful disobedience. And Dan probably has a better way to explain it than I do. Uh, no, well, I, 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 would, I would just add in that, uh, that Jesus is basically says that he's fulfilling prophecy here. And I think prophecy is such a powerful tool. I, I, I can't imagine a non-believer not being impressed with prophecy, right? This, as, as Arnie said, this was a prophecy that, that David had spoke 900 years, a thousand years before Christ, right? You have Isaiah 53, you have all of these, you have back in Genesis, right? That, that, God, that God had a plan to fix the sin issue. Right, the the Jesus has talked about it, and so you know, prophecy is is just. Uh, I think it's amazing. It's uh, Genesis three fifteen or three three fifteen or three sixteen about uh, um, the snake and uh, the heel. And the heel. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, go I, ahead. One, one quick question. I don't want to drag this out. I know, uh, but there is the phrase. I know the ones that I have chosen. Judas was not one that was chosen. Was that Judas's doing or Jesus's doing? No, I think it's uh, I think it's Judas's, and I think each person, when you come to the age of uh, accountability, has to make a choice or a decision. Um, Free will. Uh, I think I think Jesus foreknew that that Judas would reject him. Because Jesus, uh, which is who is part of the Trinity of God, does not live in linear time like we do. He has already been at the beginning and he's already been at the end. So he already knew uh, who it is that's going to reject him. Uh, and so it was each person has their own choice and decision. Otherwise, we'd, you know, we'd be, be robots. We're, 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 we're designed. Uh, in the image of God, which is eternal, uh, and and we're self-determining individuals like God is because we were designed like God. So so God gives each of us the choice, Mike. Uh, but because God is eternal, He already knew that Judas would reject Him. All right, um, I'm going to do. Uh, uh, I'm going to call on Arnie in just a second, but I would like for some, maybe two people, to think about volunteering to close us in a prayer. Go ahead, Arn. Yeah, this goes all the way back to Genesis, all the way back to Adam and Eve. I mean, he, God chose Adam and Eve. He gave them free will, okay? He also had the serpent down there. And the serpent's will overpowered Eve. It was her choice to accept what the servant was saying. He gave us free will, and she had the free will to ignore what God said or pay attention to what the serpent was saying, and she chose the wrong path. Yeah, and, and thank God that uh, we all have uh, the uh, opportunity for repentance. Uh, so God, God knew, foreknew who would reject and who would not. Uh, and God knew that we would all make mistakes, and so he put together a game plan that would uh, allow us uh, to have redemption. Go ahead, Sheila. Uh, and I think this will be the final one. We want to have two volunteers to close us in prayer, though. Go ahead, I, make it brief. I just wanted to tell Mike that in our journey, um, Renee's Monty would tell me about the select, that we were select. Yeah and elected and i had a real problem <laughs> that wrapped me around the axles for a while i was in scripture and i was getting all my ducks in a row to argue with monty but it's it's like what robert said exactly and um there's uh two you know there's true disciples and false disciples and i love what dan said uh it's an election uh elect we're all yeah what i said was we're all 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 up for election <laughs> like we're all we're all making a run for office but only a few of us get chosen all right need someone to volunteer to close us in a prayer and then i want to finish on time Pamela is going to close us in prayer. Has anybody else? 
Okay, Pamela, you got it. Mike, were you going to volunteer? I'm starting to see your hand. What? I wasn't going to, but I will. All right, we'll start with Pam. We'll finish with Mike. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we praise you and we lift you up high. Jesus, we love you. We worship and we adore you. Give us new eyes and a freshness allowing us to have a new appreciation for the suffering that Jesus went through for us. And Father, to cleanse just, us for our Father, I just uh, the poor to cleanse us from our sins. After all, the poor guy did nothing to deserve punishment, but we did. Help us to be truly truly grateful and remember every day how much he sacrificed for us be with us moment by moment and help us to fight the devil who will try to lead us astray and we ask these favors in christ's name my brother i just thank you for uh rob's teaching tonight and sylvia's participation also and and some of these questions especially the ones i've been asking uh, are at some point shrouded in a little mystery. We don't have your mind and we don't have your brain and your ways are not our ways. And Lord, we just thank you for what we do know. We thank, we, uh, we thank you for uh, what we get from reading the written word of God as Rob continually reminds us. And you can work on our hearts. You can change our minds. And Lord, I just praise you for that. I praise you for this teaching also, uh, and all the people who participate participate in it. And uh, I pray that as we walk through our journey here on earth in the coming week, that we'd keep you in our mind and your spirit would be in our heart. In Christ's name, amen. 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 Good job. Thanks. Amen.